previously seen on Music City USA Part 1, Butch Baker talked about changes in Nashville, Music Row, and the cycles of country music. We toured the beautiful Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. Frank Myers played some of his most memorable songs, and we shared some history of the well-known Ryman Auditorium. So sit back and enjoy Music City, USA, Part 2. In 1970, George Gruen opened Gruen Guitars in Nashville with an inventory of about 22 instruments. After 15 years, Gruen moved to their second location at 410 Broadway, and in 1993, Gruen moved to their third location at 400 Broadway, where it became a familiar downtown landmark until 2013. This is when Gruen moved to their current home at 2120 8th Avenue South. This easy-to-see standalone building is surrounded by colorful hand-painted murals showcasing oversized instruments. This location allows them to display an inventory of over 1,100 guitars, basses, mandolins, banjos, ukuleles, and amplifiers, including the best acoustic and electric guitar brands like Taylor, Fender, Martin, Gibson, and many more. Along with so many new instruments available for sale, George Gruen also established Gruen Guitars as one of the largest dealers of vintage and used instruments in the world. He has distinguished himself as the one to see in Music City if you're in the market for a vintage stringed instrument. George Gruen has been buying, selling, and trading used instruments since 1963. In college, I developed an interest in these. As a student, I had no job, and mommy and daddy gave me money at the beginning of each month for an off-campus apartment, food and books. And I'd go to the pawn shop shopping, I'd find interesting instruments. And for every one that I'd find that I wanted to keep, I could uncover in searches 20 or 30, it just, it's like painting for gold. I'd spend all the money that my parents gave me on the instruments. And then within the end of the week, I'd have sold off some of that other stuff, got all the I got enough money back to pay all my bills and basically recoup everything that they gave me and still keep a guitar once in a while that I wanted to keep. I came to Nashville in the beginning of 69, and I was getting tired of the academic scene, and one day in 1968, and I got a call from Hank Williams Jr., which went sort of like, hello, this is Hank Jr. Uh, Sonny Osborne from the Opry told me that you have a bunch of guitars and that you do sell and trade. I said, yeah. And he says, what do you got? And I started telling him. He said, well, I could be there in four hours. Well, so you could show up in four hours. He was driving a Jaguar E. He got as much as the car would hold, which was like three. And... Um, and he said he could be back the next day with a bigger car. And he came back the next day with a Cadillac Eldorado, and he got enough from me to fill that. And he said, Nashville didn't have anybody like me. I wasn't quite ready, but a few months later, I was. And some of these, like the guilds are prototypes, because I, I designed instruments for guilds from 84 through 88. was Gibson's most expensive model at the time. It doesn't look fancy, but this thing with case in 24 was $300.50. 275 for the guitar, 2550 for the case. And at that time, a Model T was 300. So this was 50 cents more than a Model T brand new at that time. I paid about $232,000 to buy this guitar. 
Martin received an order for this guitar from Chicago Musical Instrument Company, CMI, which was a distributor for Martin. And they got the order on October 18th of 33. It went through final inspection and was shipped out on October 31st. So not even two weeks. Lacquering takes longer now than two weeks. 33, the depression was at some of its worst, and they only made 17 of this version of the D28. One in 1931, four in 32, 12 in 33, and that's it. This is one of Dave Macon's banjos. This was made in 1940. These two, this one and this one, were owned by John Hartford, early 1935. That is their very first 18 inch. Archtop F hole guitar is a prototype. I got it from the granddaughter of the original owner who worked at Gibson as a product tester. That's the only original five string this banjo made by Gibson that we've ever been able to find or find any record of. Made around 1927. They made five like this in one work order batch. And so that's total production of this exact spec. There's five banjos, it's original five string, flat head, top tension. And I paid almost $100,000 for this thing. So it's a hobby that's gotten out of hand. Grun Guitars has now been around Nashville for over 53 years, and its growth and importance within the guitar and musical community keeps growing. Fortunately, I had some good luck early on. The first big artist to cut one of my songs uh, was Helen Reddy. And I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard and met a guy named Tornado Warren and he happened to work for Jeff Wald, Helen Reddy's husband. Anyway, I, that, I got four Helen Reddy cuts right off the bat. Uh, Lewis and I pitched a song that we wrote to a producer named Bob Ezrin for a sort of a new band called Kiss. Well, we, we pitched this song. Kim Fowley took it to Bob Ezrin, and uh, we never heard any more about it. 45 years later, a year ago this past December, our song, Ain't None of Your Business, is on the 45th deluxe anniversary set of the Kiss Destroyer album. They had cut the song and it didn't make the album. We never knew it. My biggest song to date is Angels Among Us. Alabama recorded it. Demi Lovato recorded it on YouTube after the Sandy Hook school shootings. Scotty McCreary has recorded it with other artists, with cancer survivors from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, the uh, acapella group Home Free, the Broadway star Christian Chenoweth has cut it. And the most important part about this song is that it was inspired by my guardian angel, but it has been used by numerous charities around the world to raise money. And especially, you know, when Alabama cut it, it's been used a lot for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. all about love. I was born and raised in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which is 50 miles north of Tulsa. I started playing piano when I was nine years old, and that's when I started writing songs, because uh, it was a lot easier for me to make up my own songs than to look at a sheet of paper and try to play the big notes. And my older sister uh, also took piano lessons, and uh, she turned me on to rock and roll. Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly, Ricky Nelson, Jerry Lee Lewis one of my very favorite artists. I started what has been documented as the first all-female rock band in the state of Oklahoma when I was 15 years old. And uh, we'd go out and play gigs before we were old enough to drive. Our dads would drive us to the gig and, you know, wait in the alley afterwards. I was playing in another all-girl band out of Tulsa. We wound up playing a gig in Birmingham, Alabama, and we met a band called the War Babies from Baton Rouge. And we ended up piling into their psychedelic painted school bus and
plan, the sorority houses and such. And uh, I moved uh, back to Baton Rouge and played in a southern rock band called Swamp Fox for a couple of years. And then the guitar player and I went out to Los Angeles. I went out there to be a rock star. And every time I opened my mouth, people would say, you're a country singer and started writing for Al Gallico Music, who was the number one country music independent publisher in the world. He had Tammy Wynette, Billy Sherrill, Nora Wilson, Stand By Your Man, Almost Persuaded, uh, the, the biggest songs in country music. And I was playing all the gigs. And that's what took me to Nashville. As I started coming to Nashville, Jerry Kennedy signed me to Mercury Records. I was going back and forth from LA to Nashville and started writing with people in Nashville. And I thought, well, you know, I need to be in Nashville. So I moved to Nashville right after Halloween of 1981. My last gig in LA was at the, the Rawhide and it was a gay bar and I played there a lot. But I looked around Halloween night and all the guys were dressed in drag, drop dead gorgeous in gowns and rhinestone earrings and full makeup and wigs and everything. And I looked around and I thought, man, when all the guys are prettier than I am, it's time to get the hell out of Dodge. So I moved to Nashville. <laughs> My biggest known song is Jones on the Jukebox, which I wrote to, to pay honor to George Jones. Europe with Johnny Cash. I opened for Willie Nelson, The Killer, Jerry Lee, Merle Haggard, uh, George Jones, so many of my favorites. Think about it, darling. <laughs> and Becky's a, a very traditional country writer. You know, I throw in rock and roll flavor to a lot of the stuff I do here. Um, but her stuff is traditional. It'll make you cry. It'll make you want to get on a horse. Uh, <laughs> you know, my stuff, I, I put the rock edge to it, which I didn't get any sessions when I came to town. When I moved to town, I was still working with Glenn Fry. And I went out and did some tours with him and Joe Walsh. Glenn and Joe started the Eagles Party of Two. And we did a couple of tours with that one because Glenn and Joe were always friends. And then they did that country record that they did here in Nashville where there's a whole bunch of Nashville artists cutting Eagle songs. Common Threads is what it was. And that's when the Eagles got back together. We'd already been doing Eagles Party of Two, Glenn and Joe. And uh, they both got their heads together and said, let's get the band together. And they have been doing it. But Glenn died five, seven years mm -hmm. ago. They've still been doing it. I worked with Rodney Atkins for a few years and we opened tours for Martina and Brooks and Dunn's Easy Top. And so I was putting in three, 400 days out on the road, which was tough for a guy that's no longer 25, 30 years old. I was still in the eighth grade, seventh grade. Trying the musician junior was a drummer started playing professionally then and uh, when I figured out I was a better guitar player than the guitar player, I became a guitar player. And that was all through high school, college days. That was how I earned a living. I, I got 
in bands. I played in a hundred different places, bands and stuff in LA. Copped a couple of good gigs, uh, playing with some big stars. All the Eagle guys worked with Henley and Fry and Joe Walsh and got a gig with McCartney. And then I uh, decided to come to, uh, to Nashville in 92. I slept in my car and left Fresno and Bakersfield where I was touring up and down the state in my teens and 20s. I worked for years with Sylvester Levi, who was an A-team guy. We did Hot Shots, we did a couple of Stallone movies, Whoopi Goldberg, tons of TV stuff. So I kind of had that in my background. And I've done some of that. In fact, I'm composing now for the new cable series on Nanya E, uh, which is the musical that we have in production. Nanya He, Nancy Ward, was a famous Native American that we're doing the story about her life, but not to mention she was Becky's fifth great grandmother. I'm a Cherokee Nation citizen. Uh, Cherokee Nation is now the largest federally recognized Native American tribe in the United States. But it's very important for people to know who Nancy Ward was. Her Cherokee name was Nanyahi. We have had 11 productions in four states so far. The musical has 18 songs that I wrote or co-wrote. We have an album out that we, that Dwayne produced that we cut right here in the studio of, of the songs, the concept album. Since that came out, I've probably added three or four more songs to the musical. She risked her life to make peace between the Cherokees and all others, and most importantly, the early Americans. American history would not be as it is today if she had not have lived. I'm in a new band with some great, great players, and it's uh, we're called Vinyl Machine, and we're covering songs that we've all worked on. Joe Vitale has played with everybody: David Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Eagles, Joe Walsh. He wrote a couple of big songs, Rocky Mountain Way. His son is in the band. Great all-around musician and brain. Stanley Sheldon, Tommy Stevenson played all the stuff that you heard from Peter Frampton. Myself, I played with Glenn, I played with Joe. And so every song on our set list is a number one million selling a trillion album that everybody knows. So we've been playing some gigs. As we get to one of the songs that one of us worked on, we have a little bio. Hi, I'm so-and-so. Hi, I did this. And I, my story has been, I got a call. I just worked with Henley for a minute. But Don called me and said, listen, I got another gig for you. The next day I get a call from Glenn's people. Come up and meet Glenn. Okay, I go to meet Glenn. 40 minutes later, he comes down in the bathrobe at two in the afternoon with a cigarette in his mouth and a cassette in his hand. And he sits down and he says, I've been referred. Okay, my management was Larry Fitzgerald Hartley, who'd been here in Nashville. Uh, Steve Lukather, who I just worked with on my record. And Don Henley. So evidently, I never met Glenn. He sits down with the cigarette and he goes, Henley says you're good. That's how Glenn talked. Lukather says you're good. Fitzgerald says you're good. He's got a cassette and he throws it on the table and he goes, all I can say is you better frickin' be good. <laughs> and then he turns around and walks out of the room and his road manager was there and he goes, hey, I think he likes you. <laughs> and I worked with him for 16 years till he died. We're a very functional studio. We made lots of records here and stuff, and it's state of the art. I mean, circa 2011 or so. <laughs> <laughs> lots of local artists, people you wouldn't know. Uh, Mark Slaughter came here and recorded, you know, he's a heavy rocker. But some of the cats that we've worked with, uh, James House, they. Budley. Budley, who wrote Budley. Friends in Low Places. We did a record here. The thing about this town is there is so much talent. It's very, very humbling. This was a band I was in like, well, uh, it wasn't a band, it was all studio with a bunch of the Toto guys that produced it. Big record on MCA. Nobody ever heard it. 35 years later, it became well known in Europe and, and this German label re-released it. And they contacted me and said, well, didn't you and Stephen Crane is his name, didn't didn't you guys have another band after that? And I went, yeah, yeah. Oh, send us some of that. I put them all on the computer. I started working with them and I kept sending them. Oh, do you have any more? Yeah, let me find that one. Send it to them. They loved it. I, I took out cassettes and old DAT players and put together 10 songs. The record came out six months ago in Europe. It's called Big Guns. 80s rock, babe. Yeah. We 
called it Big Hair for a while. Yeah, my mother was Frances Williams Preston, one of the uh, pioneers of Nashville. That my mother opened the office of BMI here in Nashville in 1958. She was a teenager, had graduated from college, and she went downtown. She uh, originally went in, she finally went into the National Life Building, and, you know, went in there and interviewed, and they're like, you know, we don't know what to do with you, you know? And then somebody chimed in that they were looking for somebody to work in the mail room and to deliver the mail, push the card around. And they asked her if she would do it, and she said, sure, I'll do anything. And that was the job that sort of opened up, you know, the opportunity for her to eventually become the receptionist at the WSM Grand Ole Opry. Bob Burton would come down, he was with BMI in New York, and he would come down to meet the artist and she he wanted to get him backstage at the Opry and sign them to BMI obviously it was his mission but when he got ready to open an office here he picked her to, to run it because he was so impressed with her organizational skills and her knowledge of the music and what was going on here so she actually opened the office here and it was the first building that was actually built on Music Row that was not a house converted to the music business it was a building that was built just for the sole purpose of the music industry in 1963. You know, originally there was about five employees here. She was promoted to the presidency of the company in 1986 and moved to New York where she was for the last 20 years of her life. And uh, she came back here right before she passed. But BMI was so fortunate and able to have her do this because it was really her life's calling, her life's mission. Back then, songwriters, they were the low man on the totem pole. And it was her job to see to it that they were that they were given the dignity and the recognition that she felt they deserved. And that's what BMI has always been. Nashville, I think, has benefited from more recently than than ever. Her vision uh, was amazing, and her forward-thinking attitude, her vision for the city that it's become. I mean, with the, all the activity going on in Lower Broad, all the people coming here the different companies that have moved here. Nashville is exploding. You know, BMI, we moved our operations headquarters here in 1995 and moved 15 departments here and built the building. In that process of doing that, we saved $50 million over a 15-year period, and that was money that we were able to put in songwriters' pockets. You know, we all owe it to Mom. She was an incredible person. She won numerous awards for her philanthropy. She's got a name on her building over at Vanderbilt Hospital. Uh, she was heavily involved in cancer research over there. Won a Grammy as a non-performer. So mom covered all the bases. And you know, today it's, uh, it's amazing to see how music's changed, how Nashville has become even more important as a music center across all genres. Today, country music is widely respected and it's uh, really dominating the airways and the film and all sorts of media and I think that it's something that we're just going to see more of here in Nashville. From its very beginnings, Nashville grew from a foundation built on music as the common thread connecting the life and soul of the city and its people. Nashville has had, and always will have, a diverse and open musical culture. From jazz to bluegrass, from country to R&B, and rock and roll to gospel, Nashville has had a hand in it all. Nashville's earliest settlers celebrated in the late 1700s with so many songs and musical styles right on the banks of the Cumberland River. Nashville's first celebrity, the noted frontiersman and fiddle-playing congressman, Davy Crockett, was known for his colorful stories about this city and his love for music. Nashville is a music lover's dream and is one of the best music scenes in the world. 
It has grown so much over the past few decades with very little slowdown in sight. Visitors have always ventured here to experience the music that weaves a pattern into the cultural, business, and social fabric of this place. There are so many great stories about this city, and we were only able to capture a few. Nashville's musical influence will continue to grow as more people move here to enjoy the unique hometown reputation and ongoing musical direction this city has to offer. Nashville, Tennessee certainly lives up to its title as Music City, USA. Thank you. 